Hello, everyone. Welcome to week two, episode two of the From the A to the Bay podcast. I'm Jordan Watkins alongside, of course, Bay Area legend, San Jose legend, Kevin Dana. KD, what's going on, man? How are you doing today? Body Watkins in the house. Hey, yeah, I'm, do- I'm doing good, uh, feeling good for the most part. Uh, just uh, ready, ready to be doing this, uh, ready to get to week two of the podcast, man. I love it, man. I love it. And also, since, you know, Katie's a real humble guy, so I will shout him out real quick. I believe somebody sent in a book Oh yes, uh, re- recently yes. to be published. So, uh, yeah, first off, congratulations, man. That's, that's, that's huge. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so like I sent – so I'm writing a book on – the posters you can see right behind me, the Santa Cruz Warriors, they're mostly their 2014-15 season, but basically kind of like a history of the team and stuff. I, I broadcast for the Santa Cruz Warriors. And I have sent it into Santa Cruz to make sure they're like, okay, you can still broadcast our games after writing this. Like, I want to make sure I still have a job, first off, like if we ever have another G League season, which we will. But um, so I sent it into them and basically – the the way I've kind of seen like this book play out, it started out as like being about the championship, but to me, it's more about like the players who you don't get to hear about the players who were so close to like making the NBA and never did, or who got to fly that close to the sun and just couldn't stay there for whatever reason. So that's kind of like, I'm still working on a title for it. I'm thinking like shining in the shadows or something like that. Some of the play on, you know, like, you know, underground Kings. I'm I'm not going to call it UGK. (laughs) <laughs> like uh, fun BFMC, that that name's already taken, but something like that. So yeah, it, it's like I spent the last six months working on it. So it's been cool to not have to really deal with that this week because there's not much I can do. I just send it off to the people who are like in the organization. We're gonna make the decision on this, and uh, I gotta wait for them to do something with it. So uh, yeah, so like in theory, I'm quote unquote chilling. But no, that, like I said, that's awesome. I know obviously you've been working on this for a while, and I know even to get to this point is huge. And who knows, maybe you get a, a an Icarus kind of title in there. You know, we'll we'll, we'll see what happens. But um, just <laughs> see, again, there there's know, where your fine. level of intelligence far outseeks mine. Like uh, I uh, exceeds mine. Like I've heard of the name Icarus, but uh, I uh, I got to be honest. Uh, it went way over my head. Says the guy with the Stanford and Northwestern degree. Yeah, sure. Um, but no, of course, Icarus the story. Uh, the guy thinks he can get as close to the sun as possible. As ah, closer yeah, yeah, he yeah. gets, doesn't work out. Uh, so again, just playing on, again, you were talking about how a lot of those, uh, the guys you want to focus on, it, they got close to the league, didn't make it. But I mean, I think you can't make the G League story. And probably for a lot of those guys and guys that did make it, the NBA story without yeah. you know a lot of the guys that you want to focus on yeah and I feel like it's kind of universal it's like how how many people out there are sitting right now looking at like their coworker or you know someone above them in the chain who's making like so much more money than them like I can do exactly what that person's mm-hmm. doing and like there are literally guys on the Santa Cruz Warriors that year that like way outperformed guys who are making like 48 million dollars on NBA contracts right now and it's like all right, well, that year they made $19,000 and they just sunned someone who is making 10 to 20 times as much as them. And it's like, where's the justice in that? You know, so. Of course, this uh, coming from, I don't, I don't know anyone else who would be more able to speak about this, you know, being the Elgin Cook G League truther that you oh, are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, I think His he... stats got screwed up by like an incompetent scorebook saying that he appeared in 55 seconds of one game. So it like just totally torpedoed his stats. <laughs> Free Elgin Cook's real G League numbers, which are still kept in the Santa Cruz Warriors game notes. Honestly, you all, you, all, you should uh, check Kevin's uh, Twitter bio. Again, you, you'll see, again, the, the loyalty he has, not only to the Santa Cruz Warriors, but Elgin Cook himself as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, but I think you, you said something uh, really important, and it was a good segue. You talked about justice. Yeah. And obviously, we I'd be remiss if, I, if we weren't able or didn't talk about the ruling that came out yesterday. Obviously, we're recording this on Thursday of Breonna Taylor's case in, in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Kevin, obviously, I know you've done a lot of work with the WNBA, a uh, little bit of the NBA as well, and a lot of what the players in both leagues have really wanted to do when they said, okay, look, if we're going to do this, 
we have to make sure we cover these issues. And one of them, one of the big ones, I know Donovan Mitchell in particular has been so vocal about this. And of course, the WNBA as a whole is the Say Her Name campaign and Breonna Taylor and obviously everything that came out yesterday. It, it Even though people are not surprised by it, it still definitely was a gut punch. It was 100% a gut punch. And it, I, I have a few thoughts. And of course, you know, we could go back and post-production and you can edit them all out you know this this is your oh, show please, Wadi, far, but, away, uh, far away but so a the the all right stick to sports no uh mm-hmm. wmba certainly hasn't stuck to sports the nba hasn't done it so like if we're going to be covering we we're going to be talking about the nba and wmba playoffs on this podcast so like we can't just talk about the nba and wmba without talking about brianna taylor especially when every wmba player has brianna taylor Yes. At the bottom of each of the back of their jerseys. Uh, this season was dedicated to her and, and other victims of uh, racial violence, police brutality, so on, you know, and, and everything that is like encompassed in that. So, so that's number one. Number two, you know, people are, you know, saying, and, and this is not an original thought I had, like, oh, you know, like it's not a broken system. The system's working exactly how it's meant to work right and and like that net like i mean i i believe that but like it was reinforced yesterday Mm -hmm. when like the system basically said all right well you can fire and you can fire your weapon like intentionally looking to harm maybe they weren't intending to kill rihanna taylor but they were certainly intending to harm whoever was in that building uh who they thought you know was some drug overlord or whatever. Like, I'm going to get into the war on drugs later. Don't worry, this might take a while. Um, but so there, there's that situation. But those officers don't get charged with anything. And the one officer who does is the one who fires his weapon and it goes through another apartment. So it's like the life of Breonna Taylor doesn't mean anything here. And it, it's the oh, well, that other person in some other apartment like could have gotten hurt. But the person who actually died, like we're taking no, we're, there's no accountability there at all. And, and so like, I don't know exactly how the law reads, but there, there's something in there where you can find some loophole to where Daniel Cameron can go up there yesterday and say, justice was served like there there is some way where you there are some sort of mental gymnastics that you can do within the way that the laws are written to where that's an okay circumstance and i'm and i'm don't get me wrong i'm not saying what happened yesterday was okay that's far from mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. i'm saying but there is some way in that the way the laws are written and john calipari just went on the jump and said you got to change the laws and that's what we have to do because the system is working perfectly for those in charge right now. This is what they want. Absolutely. Right? Like we've seen this year after year after year after year. I remember watching the George Zimmerman trial and seeing it played out and like hearing how the laws were written and how it was being defended. I knew that George Zimmerman was going to get off in the Trayvon Martin uh, murder. Like mm-hmm. it just, that's the way these things are written. So like the system needs to be changed. It's not broken. It needs to be changed. I mean, like, yeah, we know it's like, it's a screwed up system, but it's working exactly the way they want it to. There, there's one, you know, word that, you know, I've kind of, when I was studying Chicano studies uh, at Stanford, like that was going to be my minor, but they didn't let me double count it. And I needed to major in something. So I majored in Spanish, but like we talked about all these like killings in these central american countries or in mexico uh and the word was like impunity like these murderers can get away with in like they just have impunity to kill whoever and whenever they want and and down there in the countries that we were studying it was like kind of military personnel and the cops wouldn't do anything Mm -hmm. and it's like we're and all right so we're not having people like getting kidnapped from their homes here and i'm not saying it's like bad like that but we're having states this was essentially like a state-sponsored killing in in some respects and so like these cops who had you know not going to say all cops are bad but the cops who have committed these atrocious murders like they're getting away scot-free 
and maybe the laws aren't written that says, all right, you can kill people of color with impunity, but you have like these unions who are able to just like cover you up. And so you can get away, you can get away with murder. And, and mm-hmm. we're seeing it time and time again. Um, uh, I'm looking down on my notes because I want to make sure like I touch on sure. everything that I have to say. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and then like the, the, the base of all this for what happened March, the morning of March 13th in Louisville comes down to the war on drugs that was started like in, you know, whenever it was with the Reagan administration, in the eighties or like when it really got, really got rolling. And it's like, this was because they were trying to go after some guy who was pushing some sort of drugs or whatever. Needless, I mean, mind you that they already caught the guy and Breonna Taylor had nothing to do with it. Breonna Taylor's boyfriend had nothing to do with it. Like, so, I mean, just setting all that aside. So doubt already made all this unlawful or whatever. And then not even touching on the fact that they falsified the police reports to say that there were no injuries in the right. Breonna Taylor shooting um, and that it wasn't a forcible entry. I don't know what you call a freaking battering ram, though, to open up a door. That's not what – that's – hi, may I come in? Like, my ass. Um, so – but it, it's all on this war on drugs where, like, we crazily, like, I'm trying to think of the word to say, but like just overly punished like drug offenders. And I mean, and you know, go, go watch the 13th documentary by Ava DuVernay. Yes. On Netflix. Yeah. And so like you, you, you criminalize drugs to the extent where you can just feed this prison population. So all these people can get all sorts of money, like, you know, um, profiting off this prison population and i mean i'm a guy i don't do drugs i don't smoke weed i don't drink alcohol i mean i've had it in the past but like anyone who knows Mm -hmm. me i don't put any of that stuff in my system right but like why are drugs such a such this bugaboo outside of the obvious okay yeah we're just trying to completely demonize a whole population in our country and and just like get rich off them uh like it doesn't make any actual sense outside of just like totally screwing with and you know, discriminating, you know, entire sex of the population sex as an S E C T S. I, mm-hmm. I can't say mm-hmm. it, uh, like, um, but so, yeah, it's like, I mean, we need to change the laws. We need to get rid of the war on drugs. I mean, you know, legalize it. Like Sean Paul said, um, just, and, and we can get rid and I don't mean to be making a joke in like this situation. I, I'm sorry. Like, I don't mean to be like coming off wanton or cavalier. Um, but like just so much needs to change. I'm going to stop there. I got one more point, but I want to let you get your, uh, points in. No, sure. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I, I mean, I agree with everything you just said. And I think the thing for me is so, I'm going to take us back, everyone, real quick to 19, 1962, I believe it was, May 22nd, 1962, in Los Angeles. And there, you, I'm sure you, Kevin, and uh, so many other people, if you're listening to this, you've seen this quote around a lot, talking about who the most unprotected and the most disrespected person is in America, being the Black woman. Yeah. And... The thing I think for most people, at least for me, I, I'll, I'll say this, is that I, the main reason I think that we're all upset, angry, frustrated is, is not even the fact of the ruling happened. I think everyone, for the most part, expected these officers to get off. I mean, obviously, if you look at Louisville in general, they were boarding up everything, they calling the National <laughs> Guard a few days ahead of time. So you knew what was going on. But I think the thing for me is the fact of because you're not upset and frustrated or shocked that the ruling really happened, that, that adds to it. it. It's that you expect this. And I think you said one thing really well, too, is that so many people want to talk about this being a broken system or whatever. It's like, no, the system is doing exactly what it, it, it was meant to be. Uh, and like even going further back in terms of the police in general, 
if people don't know, the origin of the police was that it was runaway slave patrol. So even in just police in general, that that is where you start in terms of the basis of the system being flawed or broken. It's like, no, this, that's what they created to be. That's what it still is doing. And again, going back to the Malcolm X quote about being disrespected, when I mean, you talk about this case, you know, it was one thing that none of the officers were charged for murder. That That's one thing. But then the the real, the two ultimate slaps in the faces, in my opinion, was that first and foremost, you had, the only reason why the officer that was charged for anything is that because he missed. Let, 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 let's be real. Yeah. The only reason why he was charged for anything is because he missed. And that's where you get the whole wants on endangerment, you know, shooting into... And again, I think he got in somebody else's apartment building. Uh, that, that's the only reason why he was charged. So if he actually had a good aim and shot Breonna Taylor, he wouldn't have gotten charged with anything either. So that's another, that's, that, that's like slap in the face number one. And obviously the most ultimate. Slap in the face number two is if you don't think that the officers did anything wrong, why in the world is there a $12 million settlement? Amen. And not even the fact there's a $12 million settlement, who's paying for that? It's the, peop- it's the people of Kentucky. So obviously there's been this argument and debate about what exactly defund the police, abolish police, what exactly that means. Well, the thing is, especially if you're a black person, and, and obviously we can go to a whole another conversation of obviously I get it. Black people are not the only ones who are being shot and killed by police. Like there, there's a complete police issue in general. But in terms of the statistics and the, the ratio of who's more likely to be targeted by police, you can't argue that. Uh, so if you have, if you're the ones paying for the, the, the people, again, that are targeting you and they're the ones making the mistakes and you have to pay for your, the mistakes, that's a whole nother slap in the face in itself. So those two things alone, it was... Like, okay, look, like I said, everyone already expected that these officers were going to get off. But then you charge somebody for shooting a building, and then also you're going to make people pay for what you say. Apparently there's nothing wrong, but there must be because you got to settle for something. Like, you're, you're paying someone money. The, yeah. And it's just, it's just been so repetitive. And it's one of those things, again, where – like we weren't surprised because we've seen it over and over and over again. But this one, it, it did definitely did hit a little different because I think it was what we talked about. All these leagues, all these organizations have been saying it. Like I, I was even looking at a tweet uh, a little while ago uh, from the Tampa Bay Rays. And they were talking about this was back on opening day. And they were saying, yep, it's opening day. Perfect time to arrest the killers who murdered Breonna Taylor. And so yeah. many other people, organizations, whatnot, have been tweeting things like that, expressing things like that. And we're still here. Still here. And we're still here. So, um, you know, obviously, Kevin, first and foremost, I, I'm, I'm so happy. We obviously, I know you and I, we talked about if we're going to be able to address this, how do we want to address it? I'm so happy that you agreed that we can do this and lead off with it, too. Uh, but, you know, I'd be lying if I said today, yesterday, obviously, when the ruling came out, it's, it's, it's been tough. Yeah, no. And so, uh, so yeah, for forgive me for that, but it, it's no. it's been tough. <laughs> no, no, no need for forgiveness. I mean, uh, I'm with you 100 percent on everything you just said. Um, yeah, it. I mean, why why isn't this coming out? Why isn't the 12 million dollars coming out of the police budget? Right? Like, this makes it's your bad. Pay for it. At the very least, not not even getting into the criminal charges, which yes, the murderers of Breonna Taylor need to be arrested, and hopefully something comes out of this FBI investigation, something more than wanton endangerment. I didn't. I mean, I, I I'm not fluent in legalese, but I didn't know that like existed until I didn't yesterday. Um, the 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 last couple of things I just wanted to say, like you know, Tupac had that line in the in the song changes. Instead of a war on policy, they got a war on drugs so the police can bother me. Like that, that like just completely just comes to the forefront of my mind when I think about this. Then number two, and it, it's something that you said in a conversation with me, you and Big Cat, Kari Jones, for those who 
are listening to this podcast and don't know who the big cat is, but like, and, and I posted it, you can check my Facebook page. I, I posted uh, something on this as well. It's like, and we still got all these people running around saying America is the best country on earth. And it's like, how are you saying that right now? And who cares? Like, why do we profess love for this idea of a nation? It's like, it's like we love it like our mom. Like, it makes no sense to me. Like, this, na- these nationalistic ideals, like, just put us to, like, you know, pit us against other nations, get into wars, yada, yada, yada. But, like, how can you objectively say America is the best country in the world? We are the best country in the world at spreading the coronavirus, for sure. We are somewhere on, like, the racism leaderboard somewhere probably pretty high, but like, I don't know the rest of the, the world. And like, I know there's racism in other parts of the world. I don't, I can't tell you how it compares to, to the racism that exists in America, but like, those are two pretty huge societal and mental and and, uh, medical ills that we are so far behind on and have been, you know, for the last six months for the coronavirus and since the dawn of this nation on, on the racism front. And we're going around saying, like, getting upset. Our president is getting upset about the 1619 Project because he doesn't want people to, like, learn properly about slavery in the United States. I mean, it's a joke that we have, like, the person in charge, like, completely trying to rewrite history and then we are stupid enough as a country to politicize science and like to the point where we have people like not wanting to wear masks because it's their personal freedom. Oh, how dumb are we? And I, you know, I include myself in that. Like, it's not a, you guys are dumb. We are dumb as a country. And, and we still got people saying, Oh, this is the best country in the world. God bless the US of A. I, I don't want to hear it anymore. No, I, I appreciate those sentiments so much. And there's so much more I could go into on that subject, but I just want to leave everyone with this before we take a quick break. Uh, for everyone that wonders why people keep saying Black Lives Matter, I, you saw it yesterday. There was a Black woman's life who was, that was taken away, and yet the thing that mattered the most important was the walls of an apartment building over hers. Um, so we're we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I am actually very excited. Um, one of my best friends, former roommate, uh, teammate, you know, he works in the Big Ten now, Nor Davis, is going to come on with us and share just some of his experiences, you know, through his life and how he got to where he is now. Uh, it's going to be an, an exciting conversation. I'm so ready for it, and again, Brianna Taylor, we're going to keep fighting for you and saying your name. All right, everyone, welcome back to the From the A to the Bay podcast. And now I am so excited and happy to introduce one of my best friends for life. It was one of my best roommates, uh, teammate, you name it, Nor Davis, tuning in from Chicago. Nor, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm doing great, Wadi. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Kevin, thank you for having me. Uh, Honored to be here with you guys. No, absolutely. We again, we appreciate you being on. And again, so for the for the viewers and listeners, uh, I'm just going to do a quick rundown of some of the achievements that you had. It's a long list. So I'll, I'll try to make it as short as possible. Uh, you know, coming out of high school, Under Armour All-American and linebacker, you won the butt kiss award as well, I believe. You come to Stanford, you get two degrees, you get to roommate with this really cool dude named Jordan Plotkins. Uh <laughs> You know, obviously after that, you were in uh, with the Minnesota Vikings, made it throughout the whole preseason. And by the way, for everyone, I just want to let you know, if you make it through a preseason in the NFL like that, that's legit. Like it's a whole lot harder than I think a whole lot of people believe and understand. So like, dude, dude is nice. Um, And then, of course, after that, you were a scout for the Lions and now you're working with the Big Big Ten. Uh, So, yeah, I mean. Like I said, so many accolades to name and list, and there's so many more that I didn't even name. Just kind of walk me through some of those things, man. Like from where you were, I know when we first met to to where you are now. Yeah, no, obviously uh, the most important, 
important thing on that list was rooming with a guy in daycare 440, uh, Jordan Watkins. So that's the that's the biggest accolade of them all. But uh, it also I didn't pay him to say that too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, it's it's been a blessing. I've had a I've had a great life, uh, continuing to try to excel and and try to maximize the most of it. But I've had a great support system from my parents, my my brother, my family, uh, just to allow me to to achieve some of the things that I've been able to do. And then you couple that with uh, you know, great teammates, great friends, great peers, um, and just people that have encouraged me and pushed me and mentored me in life. Uh, so just very, very grateful and blessed to have the people in the life that in my life that I do uh, to allow me to get to where I am today. I, I was curious, what, A, how long were you guys roommates for at Stanford? And B, like, where did you guys live? I know like a lot of athletes live in Miralees, which is, you know, mm -hmm. pretty close to like the athletic fields and stuff. Uh, yeah. So yeah. What, what, what were those situations? Yeah. So we actually started as roommates in Miralees uh, okay. as a junior. Uh, so we were roommates, our junior, senior and fifth year. So three years we were roommates wow. together. I uh, had a great time from Miralees to Oak Creek. Uh, Wadi's been my, been my brother for, for forever and, and will be my brother for forever and, and a lifetime. Um, so just, just very blessed to have Wadi in my life and, and his mom, his dad, uh, just, just great people, uh, extended family. And, uh, yeah, day, daycare 440. Uh, I'll let Wadi tell you that story at another, <laughs> another time, but, uh, we've had a, have a, had an unbelievable time as roommates. Yes, sir. Shout out daycare 440. We will take care of anyone that needed it. And also we will take care of you in FIFA as well. That's so there's a little <laughs> double entendre on that one, but, um, yeah, let's, let's get into it even a little bit more of, uh, some details just in terms of, like I said, so now you're working in the Big Ten, you work closely with Kevin Warren. What was it about, was there a certain moment in your in your playing career before or after where it's like, this is what you want to do or something that opened up where this is where you are now? Yeah, I, I want to say ever since I was a kid and you can fact check me with my parents, uh, they have always known uh, I've been interested in being uh, in the business side of sports. So whether that's professional, whether it's collegiate as, a, as an administrator. Um, so I was just very blessed to obviously get this opportunity. My relationship with uh, Commissioner Warren cultivated from my experience playing for him uh, with the Minnesota Vikings. And uh, at the time he was the COO, the chief operating officer. Um, and so he, I guess he took a liking to me and that's something that he had mentioned is just by the way I went about my business and the way I performed and handled myself off the field and on the field. Um, and just gave me an opportunity to join the conference as the first fellow uh, in the history of the conference uh, from the from the Detroit Lions. He, he called me up one day, and I was just really, really excited for the opportunity um, and just very grateful to work for a man like him. He's just a, a high-quality individual, a God-fearing man, um, and just a, a person that you, you would aspire to be like. Um, and I think a lot of the, the things that we kind of hear, uh, I don't think they pay enough uh, mentioned to how how great of a man and human being he is and everything that he does in life and everything that he's done with the conference is structured around uh, excellence and also the care of at the Big Ten it's our student athletes at the Minnesota Vikings about the 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 you know the players and the staff and so everything he does is in mind and, and with an altruistic mindset to care for others. Nora I'm curious because when you hear the term COO like as he was for the Minnesota Vikings, you don't think of someone who's going to be like sitting on the practice field, watching guys go through a training camp. I envision a guy who's behind a desk taking care of, you know, the financial matters of, of a professional operation. So how, how did you come into like Kevin Warren's like airspace, if you will, in the first place? Yeah, I guess it's uh, it's something that, you know, a, a relationship that was cultivated. Uh, he took a liking to me. Um, and it was just something that really just meant a lot to me. Uh, and say so he obviously is somebody that's more behind the desk, but he had a great role. Uh, the way the Vikings organization is structured, they don't have a team president. And so the COO is kind of that stand in owner, uh, essentially. So he's not necessarily the president. He's kind of a little bit uh, higher than a president. Uh, normal job description would be because the ownership group sits in, in New Jersey. And so uh, Kevin did an amazing job. Uh, with the Vikings, he built their new training facility. He was, uh, you know, he built their, their stadium. And obviously you saw that stadium for the Super Bowl, and you've seen it many, many times. Uh, I've played in a lot of venues. Wadi and I have played in a lot of venues. Um, and, and the Viking stadium has to be one of the most beautiful uh, facilities I've ever played in. And uh, he, he had a, 
instrumental role in creating that. And so he's just kind of had his hand in a lot of things and uh, just, just very honored and, and, and favored to be uh, in, in his life and uh, as well as having him in mind. Yeah, I must say that uh, USB Bank, U- US Bank Stadium, excuse me, uh, one of the coolest places I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, how many stadiums have you seen that are shaped after a ship? Yeah, uh, right. You know, like that, that's so cool. And I know, I think they have one at the practice facility too. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nor, but no, definitely one of the coolest places I've ever seen. Uh, it's awesome. Obviously they get some prints playing whenever touchdowns are going on. They have the, <laughs> the, the, the Galler horn, everything. It, it's so awesome. The skull chant. Uh, the skull chant, uh, mm-hmm. which, you know, I'm partial to as an Atlanta United fan. We have a <laughs> knockoff version of it where, you know, we do ATL instead of skull, but uh, just going forward, so one of the things you talked about, too, uh, in terms of uh, Commissioner Warren's emphasis on, obviously, student athletes and the well-being of them, and again, like, uh, you and I, we've talked off camera, I applaud the Big Ten, obviously, being one of those first conferences that decided not to play, and now you're coming back, uh, and obviously not getting into the details of the you know, why you're coming back, because I know that hasn't been out. But I guess tell me about that kind of timeline, at least for you, because you've been in this position now for about like what eight, nine months. Uh, so yeah, like, well, welcome to the job. Uh, <laughs> you have to, you have to deal with that. So I guess kind of walk me through that timeline and how it was for you from, you know, the cancellation to, to where we are now. Yeah, it's been an exciting eight, nine months. Um, it's been a crazy eight, nine months, uh, to say the least, uh, you know, for my second month on the job, being at the men's uh, men's basketball tournament and having to cancel that and be a part of that uh, to then now going on remote. And obviously it's not just us, the entire world is experiencing this. It's a global pandemic. Um, a lot of people have lost jobs, have been furloughed. Uh, it's just a diff- difficult time for everybody. So my heart goes out to everyone uh, going through this process. I-, I feel for you, I pray for you. And I just hope we can get through this and get stronger and come together uh, better. Uh, but you know, it's been a, a crazy journey, uh, but, but Commissioner Warren has done an amazing job. Uh, his co- coming into the Big Ten, he had a, certain pillars that we've been able to establish, wh- whether that's uh, voter registration, uh, mental health. We created a mental health cabinet, uh, financial literacy for our student athletes. Uh, we, we were able to uh, get Calm, the, the app for mental health, out to every student athlete, every staff member in the Big Ten Conference. So that's been amazing. Um, And then the formation of the anti-hate and anti-racism coalition. Um, He's been able to establish a lot of amazing um, committees and and groups and just pillars and and, and foundations to the Big Ten that didn't exist. I, you and I never experienced that at the the Pac-12 and in uh, in college. And that just never existed at any conference. And so it was amazing that he had that vision coming in. He was able to establish it, hit the ground running um, and just build on it in the constant evolution of things that have, has transpired since have, have, have always been in the thought of the student athletes. And, and one of the biggest things that I'll say about Commissioner Warren is he wants to treat every student athlete as if they were one of his children. And he has a son who plays uh, college football at Mississippi State. He has a daughter who played volleyball at Occidental College. So he has been that. He played college basketball at Penn and Grand Canyon. His, his uh, older brother played football at Stanford in the 60s. His, his, his father played uh, football. So you know, there's, there's just a, a list and litany of, of people who in his life who have been student athletes. And it's such a driving force and factor in his life that everything he does is centered around the health and wellness of the student athletes. And that's part of the reason why we postponed uh, our announcement and delayed the season was to just make sure that we had all of our boxes checked that make sure our student athletes are going to be safe and healthy. And then when we did announce the return, obviously just, just, just recently that we had the, the measures and protocols in place that would really make sure that they would be safe, um, that there wouldn't be, uh, you know, a, a limit and, redu- you know, running out of tests. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the health boxes were checked and we formed a lot of subcommittees from uh, the medical subcommittees to the scheduling subcommittees to the TV uh, scheduling subcommittees to create um, the best decisions to then pre- present to uh, the, pack- the, the governors, uh, the presidents and chancellors, or our CEO group, and uh, make the best decision for our student athletes. And so we are recording this on September 24th. So exactly one month from today, we will have Big Ten football. And nor, you know, you, you're 
your title is a fellow for, for the Big Ten Conference. I was just curious, kind of like, what is your day-to-day and what are your interactions like with Kevin Warren? Yeah, so I'm, I'm very involved uh, with my relationship with, with Commissioner Warren. Obviously, it's been a little bit uh, more difficult with his, his schedule and obviously the things that he's had to endure recently um, and obviously not being in the office every day, being with him. Uh, but a lot of my job is uh, managing special projects, helping on, assist, um, on various subcommittees. I'm heavily involved in a, a lot of different groups. So I kind of have my hands in a, in a lot of things to get visibility. Uh, it's really a, a developmental type of role to really just learn um, all a- aspects of the business and to just really grow and um, kind of develop business savvy and busy business acumen um, and just really contribute in, in any way uh, that I can uh, in any way that uh, I'm encouraged to do so. And so just, just, just very grateful to work under Commissioner Warren and my other peers at the conference. So, Noor, obviously we were both student athletes, and this is something we did not have to deal with, right? Obviously there was no <laughs> pandemic or anything that we had to deal with. But I guess from your standpoint, you know, you, you've been on both sides of the, of the table. Uh, I think there's been in, in certain situations or certain schools a whole argument about how this kind of really overemphasizes the business aspect of college sports. I mean, obviously college basketball is going to come back soon, but in particular college football. And so just thinking about, again, the, the business standpoint of it, and I'm sure I'll probably say something about this down the road as well too on the podcast, but how much do you think that like that has even has been emphasized even more with this pandemic? Obviously there are some conferences that did not decide to delay and, you know, they're having their issues uh, with some testing or whatnot, but how much do you think that's brought that whole business aspect to the forefront even more um, as of late? Yeah, obviously the the world knows how, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry that really sources a lot of revenue, not only for our schools, our institutions, but for our surrounding communities, for television. Uh, there's just a lot of business involved in the, in college sports. But the one thing that I will say is the, the business is, is obviously a driving factor, but at the end of the day, like what we did uh, at the Big Ten by, by waiting and postponing and just putting our student athletes health and wellness at the forefront, it showed that our direction was less about the business and more so about the student athletes. Um, obviously, it, it's impacting schools, it's impacting budgets, it's impacting certain institutional programs. Uh, obviously, you saw at Stanford, a lot of you know, sports teams got cut, um, and which is, which is very, very unfortunate my heart goes out to all those sports and all the the, I had a a whole bunch of friends Uh, you and I both had a whole bunch Mm -hmm. of friends that played in those on those sports programs and I couldn't imagine what they're going through Um, but I will say that uh, when you put the student athletes health and wellness before the business obviously it it impacts the financial uh, results and 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 what where the 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 budget line can go but at least you're you're caring for the health and, and well-being first. And I think that's what's the, the most quintessential point uh, of what's happening during this time. And at the end of the day, you know, we're student athletes, they're not uh, professionals. And so, you know, they're, we have to put them first and, and, and make that decision. Um, and I know it's, it's much to the chagrin of many other people, but uh, there's a lot of other barriers that, that are, you know, in, it come in between uh, finally touching that field. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great point you make. Like, these are still, you know, 18 to 22 year old kids, right? They're not professional athletes. So like, yeah, I mean, just from, I guess, you know, from a messaging standpoint or, or whatever, like how, like, how, how tough can, can that be to like get people to realize, Hey, th- these are still kids, right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're well, not, you know, they're not making $30 million a year. So we, we got to um, make sure they're, they're good health wise. Yeah, I think for for you and I and, and Wadi, I think it's it's we understand that. Um, but a lot of people, and obviously you can see from the decisions that were made across the country, not just at our, our level, but across the country, and the amount of uproar that that kind of caused, um, you can see that some people don't necessarily understand that same element. Uh, and I think that it is really important that you know I, some sometimes it's eighteen, sometimes it's seventeen, and seventeen to twenty two year old kids who are, are basically performing and going to school 
uh, but the surrounding communities are, are really looking forward to watching them on Saturdays or Fridays or whatever day it may be. And so they're not looking at them in the same light that you should. And at the end of the day, uh, the one thing that I, I just would hope is that, and I hoped it as a student athlete, is that more people in the communities realize that at the end of the day, they are student athletes. We are just student, student athletes. We are human beings and uh, our health should come at the forefront of any entertainment that you might, might try to try to watch. And I think that our conference did a wonderful job in, in making sure that our, the health and wellness was at the forefront of any decisions that we made. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And again, like I've, I've said to Kevin many times and Nor, you know, this too, uh, I have nothing, nothing bad to say about the big 10 in terms of, you know, how you all have gone about this because Again, um, from everything I've seen or, you know, what people have read, it looks like everything is in place in terms of, again, player safety and well-being coming first, uh, which is great because I think at the end of the day, so I know the Pac-12, I think they're going to even be deciding here shortly, too, about what they're going to do. Uh, and all of us, we're all football fans here. Uh, first and foremost, I, I just want to say that because, again, there is that idea that a lot of media people, which is weird to keep telling uh, and affiliating myself as a media person, but that we don't want football and sports to happen. But no, we do. We definitely do, especially all three of us. We're Stanford people. We want exactly. to get the ax back this year. So like, we, we can't <laughs> let that sit over there for two years. So no, we definitely want it to happen. And But at the same time, I appreciate and I'm so happy and proud of the Big Ten of how you all have handled this and how you're going forward. So I, again, I just wanted to reiterate that to you. Um, and, and again, Commissioner Warren, I know he's had a lot on his plate. So again, if you, I mean, just talk about his leadership in this time, because I'm, again, like you said, like, I know this has been a very stressful situation in time for him. So like, and, you know, tell me a little bit about him and how he's handled it and just what you've seen and learned from a leadership standpoint from him. Yeah. I, I tell him all the time. Um, one of the most valuable things that I've been able to do and learn through his leadership is is just how to really care for people first uh, and so one of the best best things i and things i compliment and tell him is i learned to become a leader by becoming a follower you know i, I watch the way he goes about his business and the way he handles things the way he puts uh the student athletes first he puts family first he puts god first and he bases his decisions off of those um and and the one thing that i you know i just want to kind of make it crystal clear is he was not the person that said Big Ten is, is canceling the football or postponing the football season. And he was also not the same person that said Big Ten, Big Ten is resuming the football season. That decision comes from the presidents and chancellors. And so he has to then gather the information from various subcommittees, from the athletic directors, from coaches, from administrators, and then disperse that same in, information to the presidents and chancellors for them to make the overall decision. And so one thing that I will say during this time uh, Commissioner Warren's leadership. And obviously this is my first year on the job, but this is also his, this is his mm -hmm. first year on the job. This is his first nine, 10 months on the job. So I can't imagine a, a tougher start to any commissioner's career than a global pandemic. But uh, one of the things that he's always done is try to create the biggest sense of communication and collaboration. And that's something that is incredible that he, he was able to do. Uh, we've been able to have, daily calls. Uh, it's modified as of recently with the announcement, but for the past five months, we were having daily calls with all the athletic directors. We were having weekly calls with the football coaches. Uh, we were able to meet with the athletic directors hundreds of times, uh, football coaches many a times. And so the ability to have that communication in, in, in a few amount of months is greater than you would probably have in a few years. And that's the one thing that I will say, you know, thankful to this global pandemic, uh, because it's allowed people to have greater communication with each other through Zoom calls, through Microsoft Teams, through just picking up the phone and having conversations. Um, so it's allowed people to have greater consistent communication, uh, something that we would not normally have. So that's, that's been an been a, a amazing thing to see. And it's uh, a testament to Commissioner Warren's leadership. Nor on a personal level, I'm curious, and obviously you're still going through the process of being a fellow, but eight or nine months deep into it, how, how has this kind of shaped your idea of how you see your future playing out somewhere in the sports business world? Well, it's definitely 
affirm that this is what I want to do. And one of the things that you can see is if you can operate in rocky waters, imagine when it's calm. And so that's yeah. one thing that I can really kind of tip my hat off in, in my first eight, nine months on the job to be able to watch Commissioner Warren operate in all this turbulence and still stay afloat and still be positive and still be God fearing and, and, and all eyes forward and, and still making the best decisions. Um, that's something that definitely makes me strive to continue to do this, th what I'm doing, uh, but also just excited for when that time comes in my life where I'm in a leadership position or I'm able to be able to a decision maker and times of adversity, times of tribulations and trials come about. I know it can't be much worse than what we're going through right now. And so if we can get through this, we can get through anything. And that's something that, uh, you know, Commissioner Warren's always uh, said and that, that, that motto and that uh, initiative, that focus has then shifted and transcended to the 50 plus people on our staff. And uh, we're just kind of heads down, just doing the best that we can to, you know, focus on the, the return to, to sports, uh, obviously give, give great product, but also, you know, show that this is, this is about the student athletes, this is about the staffs, the faculties, the coaches, and just doing the best we can to care for and uh, be successful in that regard. You can live through anything if magic made it, right? Exactly. <laughs> Kanye said it best. <laughs> So yeah, that's the uh, uh, Nor. That's pretty much all I have for you, man. Again, everyone, I can't say enough about Nor. Just the person that he is, the the brother that he is, and obviously you see what he's doing on the Big Ten level. Nor, again, I appreciate you so much for coming on, talking with us a little bit, you know, about what your journey has been, not only just over your life, but especially these last few months. And you know, last but not least, uh, I want to give the floor to you. Uh, I know you were in here a little bit when we were finishing up talking about. Brianna Taylor and and her uh, case results. If there's anything you want to say uh, as about it as well, I want to leave the floor to you now. No, I mean it's obviously a, a devastating tragedy um, what happened um, and what is continuing to happen throughout the country throughout the the history of our time. You know, obviously nothing has changed really, unfortunately now to what it was many years ago, the only thing we have now is cameras. We have the ability to document what is happening. And that is devastating. Um, I live in downtown Chicago. I, I, all the surrounding buildings have, after the George Floyd, after the, all the other incidences, um, Jacob Blake, you know, the, the buildings have been looted and, and just the damage that has been, been caused through this whole process. And it's, it's because of anger and fear. Um, I don't condone that violence. I don't condone the looting. But what this has taught us is that people are, are done. People have had enough. People are fed up. Um, and I wish that there was a more tactical approach to go about this. And I just wish that more people would come together with love, compassion, and sincerity, empathy. Um, all these things are the driving forces that will create a bond um, and hopefully propel us through these times. And obviously, vote vote. One of the biggest things that we've been able, to, been able to establish with the Big Ten is our voter re registration group, just to implore student athletes, implore people to get out and vote. Uh, you know, it, this, this, what's going on in this world is really painful for me. Um, being a mixed kid and a, a son of a law enforcement, with a, with a law enforcement father, what's going on right now is very, very painstaking for me because this has turned into a black versus white and a black versus cops thing. And that's not what it's about. At the end of the day, uh, one of the biggest things I always try to implore and, and, and tell people is that there are certain things in life that were created to divide us, race, religion, political affiliation. Those things were put on this earth to divide us. And at the end of the day, you strip all of that down and we are human beings. We might have different thoughts and different ideologies, but at the end of the day, if we can, really look at each other and say, we are human beings. We have compassion. I have empathy for you. Your struggle is something that I've struggled with. My struggle is something you've struggled with. If we can really look at each other like that, we can hopefully turn the page and just create a, a united states. Because right now we are not united. Uh, Amen. And that's the biggest thing that we need to have um, going into this election. And just the driving force at the end of the day is just, just love, pure pure love.
No, I mean, I, like I said, I, I couldn't have said it any better. Um, and again, I'm just happy that I'm always happy, nor, you know, to give you anyone else the platform to speak, say anything. I know you've been very vocal on social media about a lot of these topics. And uh, I mean, that that was I could like I said, I couldn't say it any better. Couldn't say it any better. Um, I appreciate you so much for hopping on, man. Love you, brother. Uh, we'll be talking soon. Uh, you know, obviously, especially like Kevin said, we're a month away now from from Big Ten football. So, you know, I'm going to be texting you about what's going on and what I see. Uh, but yeah, again, thanks again, Nor. Appreciate it. I, thanks, I Nor. Can't wait. Love you, Waddy. All love. Give my best to your family. Thank you for having me on, Kevin. Thank you for having having me on. It was an honor and a privilege. And uh, I can't wait for the next time. Yeah. Thanks, Nor. Look, to, awesome, look forward to having you back. Oh, absolutely. You guys take care. You too. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, welcome back from the A to the Bay podcast. Again, you just listened to Nor Davis. Uh, again, as one of my brothers, I can't stop the compliments and, and accolades of, of everything he's done and the person that he is. And uh, and again, Kevin, like I said, that was from Big Ten to his life to, again, Brianna Taylor. I think he was spot on about so many things. Yeah, no, it was great to hear from Nor. Obviously, you know him a lot better than I. I got a chance to know him a little bit through Kari, uh, Kari Jones, uh, our our big boss or formerly big boss uh, back when he was at Stanford. And yeah, no, I I always enjoyed talking with Nor. And yeah, you know, it, it was great getting to hear his thoughts on the Big Ten and just kind of you know how he came up in the business for for those last thirty minutes. Uh, it was great listening to him. Absolutely, and again, the thing for me that. I'm so happy with the Big Ten doing and seeing stories is, I mean, even this week, you see all these games that have been postponed, uh, obviously in the ACC, Virginia Tech and Virginia still haven't played yet. I want to say Notre Dame has that postponed their game this week because of issues that they're having. Don't get me started so. <laughs> on Notre Dame. <laughs> obviously, Kevin is not a big fan of, of how many people they had in attendance at their last home game, but you see all those things, and, and I can't help but to keep thinking that all those conferences rushed into it for, again, the, the money aspect of it that we, we went into a little bit. So the fact that you do have this Power Five conference being the Big Ten, with and, and again, you think about some of the names in college football in terms of you know, Michigan's one of those big-name teams. Ohio State, obviously. There's Penn yep. State. Minnesota's up on the rise of P.J. Fleck. Wisconsin's always been a really good team. And then even on the individual level, in terms of the Justin Fields of the world, all of that, and you still, as a conference, decide, nope, we don't need to do this right now. Let's take our time. You find this way to get a system and structure in place. Now you're going to come back to it. My thing has always been, and I, we talked about this last podcast too, if there was a way to go about playing football this year, that is absolutely the way to do it. Yeah, and, and I I agree. Like, if it's safe and med med medically safe to do, which uh, we are starting to see, like, yeah, it is medically safe to do. Then let's play. Let's let people do what they love to do. Let's help the economy the best we can. And I, the one thing I like about this Big Ten plan is no fans in stands, unless you know, I think they they might make exceptions. Like, uh, uh, you know, reading some ESPN reports, they might make exceptions for you know like certain family members or whatever, kind of like how you see like in the NBA bubble, the WNBA bubble, mm -hmm. but like, so like taking it to Notre Dame, which is in big 10 territory, it's right there yeah. smack dab, like 90 minutes away from Chicago. I've made that drive from Chicago to South Bend. Uh, they had 10,000 plus fans at each of their first two games. I think I said 30,000 fans uh, on the last podcast when I was watching the Notre Dame Duke game is because like they were clumped together like in one. So like there wasn't a whole lot of social distancing going on. So you have two games at home with 10,000 plus fans. And then what do you know, seven of your players test positive in this last week. And it's like, all right, yeah, obviously during the game, the players are more than six feet away from uh, the, the fans in the stands, but you can't create like a bubble you can't com create like a complete enclosed bubble where your football players are interacting with nobody else on the campus. Like it doesn't quite like, and I don't know exactly how it works in Notre Dame, but like those two things are not completely separate of each other. You know, all the like, there were two different outbreaks in Notre Dame 
at the end of August. And then two weeks later, there are 10,000 fans in the stands. And then two weeks after that, there's, you know, they have a testing rate of higher than 7% on their football team, which Ooh. is a really high number. And now South Florida can't play their game, the team yep. that just most recently played uh, Notre Dame. It's, you got to be smart about this. And I don't know what Notre Dame was thinking besides, we have to recoup some of our dough. Let's let in 10,000. The fans need it. Let's, you know, like Georgia says, oh, you can't tailgate, but you can gather and drink beers together. <laughs> Come on. I mean, this is so – Alabama's going to have 20,000 fans at their first home game. This is idiotic. Like, it, it doesn't work. And, and I think that's the thing where even – so like you mentioned, the bubble and the wobble, when they started off, it was no fans. No fans, yeah. no family members, everyone's isolated. And then once things got progressed, that's when you started bringing people in. So I'm, I'm with you 100% in terms especially of these – conferences and schools where you just started right away that bringing in all these fans and I get it again I understand the the money aspect of it this is a business but again just from right away you're you're bringing in you know potentially what 20 25 30 percent of your capacity it it is I I I mean I mean, we just, as a country, we just surpassed, what, 200,000, I believe, yeah, deaths, 200, in, deaths in the country. So it's just, it, I mean, not even just the science part of it alone. I'm going to, you know, leave that alone because obviously I'm not a scientist. But yeah, opt, in my opinion, as a, you know, from a comm student and, and, and optics is a lot of what I studied and, and research, optically, that just doesn't look good to me. It really no, doesn't. It, you know what else doesn't look good optically is – like, did you see the picture of how the Clemson fans were sitting? How oh, yeah, were, the, like, it was like vertical? Yeah, yeah. And there's someone tweeted like, I didn't know that coronavirus only spread horizontally. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, they, like, there's no way that like one row behind you is six feet away. Like, mm. you, you're on top of each other just in like this huge vertical column of fans. And not even that, even if you are like separated six feet away from you know, people in the stands, like, how did you get into the stadium? Did they let one person in at a time for like 12 hours to get to 10th that like, no, you, you are coming within contact of other people, not in your cohort as you get into the stadium and get situated, get seated. It, whatever. No, that's, that's a great point. I think uh, one thing that I should definitely do and I'll work on, uh, I actually have a friend who works with game day operations at Georgia Tech. And I've seen a lot of behind the scenes action of what he's had to do and everyone else that's on his team to get Bobby Dodd Stadium prepared for game day. And so I think a lot of what we're saying right now are questions that we have, he would be perfect to answer. Yeah. So you know, I'm, I'm going to see if we can get him on because uh, my week. my preparation for game day would be put a giant tarp on every seat to make sure no one can sit down and watch the game in person yeah and, and I, I really do wish it was somewhat that simple but i know for him they you know they got to yeah. mark off that you can sit here you can't sit here etc cetera, etc cetera. It's, a, it's a painstaking uh operation to say the least um yeah moving on so for us like we, we did mention this a little bit. We're talking about the wobble and the bubble. So let's start with the NBA, WNBA playoffs. Excuse me. Uh, again, obviously, if you watched last week, Jordan Laggins, phenomenal job. Yeah. And continues to do a phenomenal job. If you haven't seen her on Twitter, um, Shay Serrano, who's obviously a phenomenal Twitter follow, highlights and compliments her all the time as well. But we're in the semifinals now. You're in the WMA semifinals. Yeah. Um, obviously, one thing that was interesting to me is how this was one of the big moments, I think, for, for the Wubble of how they were going to deal with COVID outbreaks or COVID scares. And I'm talking about the Seattle Storm, Minnesota Lynx series. Game two is tonight. Uh, game one, when you talk about all the way to the end, a missed putback, it was, was yeah. the difference. But I think, Kevin, also you, you, you see how well the WNBA is and was prepared to handle any type of COVID scare situation, you know, starting there. Yeah, because uh, there were a couple of inconclusive cases or they weren't sure if a person was testing negatively. Um, 
or or not. And, and it's something that had happened in the bubble before. I remember Taya Cooper had a of the Los Angeles Sparks had an inconclusive test, and so like ju- they just made sure that everything was cleared up. Um, yeah, it was scary to go through it on Sunday when they announced. When you hear like Ryan Rucco, I believe was on the call. Maybe it was Pam Ward like saying during the Connecticut Las Vegas game that the Lynx Storm game has been postponed because of like an inconclusive test, or we didn't know exactly what it was at the time turned out to be like inconclusive tests. Um, But they, they had dealt with that before and they, they handled it. It Turned out that though those tests came back negative and they were able to play two days later and it doesn't really throw off the timetable all that much at all. So I, I thought they definitely handled that well, and you know we were treated to a great game one, and especially a great finish. Yeah, definitely, and, and I think you know going into game two, and and we talked about this with Jordan too. You talk about two of the franchises that have really shaped the image or face of the WNBA the last decade or so. Here you go, and yeah. so I, I mean I expect nothing less of but a really fun game two. Uh, and so, Kevin, I mean, what, what, are you, what are you thinking here for game two? Obviously, I was not very good with my WNBA picks <laughs> last week. So, I mean, we'll see if I make a decision on this one. But, Kevin, what are you thinking? Yeah, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll give us a, a series prediction here since yeah. you know, by the time we put, put this up, uh, game two will have happened. But, I, you know, like there's part of me that wants to see the Battle of the Sisters because I'm a Stanford guy. I want to see Erica McCall mm-hmm. go up against Dewana Bonner. But there's the other part of me that enjoys watching the Seattle Storm more as a team just because of the players that they have. When you think about Brianna Stewart, when, when, you, when you think about, uh, you know, uh, Sue Bird, Natasha yep. Howard, Jordan Canada, who I've been a fan of since her UCLA days. Um, so you, you think about Stewie, you know, like, like I mentioned, like just, they're so fun to watch. And, I, and they had a better season. And if Sylvia Fowles isn't at 100%, that that's a lot of things going against you if you're Minnesota. Now the Lynx certainly have a lot of good players. Like I'm a big Demiris Dantas fan. I always mm-hmm. love watching Erica McCall play. Um, you know, Odyssey Sims has been great since returning to action. Uh, but I do think this is a four game series. Minnesota three one. I mean, excuse me, Seattle three one. Seattle three one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. I think we talked about this before too, where. There are two players in particular. Obviously, I know you brought up Sylvia Fowles for Minnesota, but I think about, again, Nafisha Collier, Collier, excuse me. How uh, could I forget 20, her? 25 points in, in game one. Uh, Crystal Dangerfield, who, again, we talked about, you know, rookie of the year. It, and and that, I think that was the thing for me where you're in this big moment. You're against this great team, as you mentioned, a lot of big names. Again, Sue Bird, hard to talk about the WNBA as a whole let alone even still now without yeah. her. And again, Brianna Stewart, who, again, I implore everyone, if you have not seen the accolades on her Wikipedia page, do it, do a favor and, and go look at it for yourself. It's, it's you'll quite be busy impressive. for a while. Yeah. You'll, you'll be, you'll be busy for a while. Uh, but I, uh, again, I'm, I'm just going to go with, I think the, this, this, this young Lynx team, when you're in a situation like the wobble, certain things, they, they don't, affect you like certain I think playoffs usually would uh and especially again we talked about it being led by those two young players and again you talked about Odyssey Sims is as fun as she is to watch too I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with the Lynx okay I, even I, I down down 1-0 you're still taking that, that, down that is a bold prediction that again like I said prediction. don't 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 go to Vegas off my pick because we <laughs> saw how I was last week but I'll, I'll, I'll go with the Lynx all right all right speaking of Vegas what do you got in Ace's son so it's tied up at one one. This has been such an interesting series to me because through the first two games we've really seen complete opposites, right? Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, and I think part of this for me is being a an Atlanta Dream homer. I want to see Angel McCautry get that first ever evasive ring. Uh, you know, obviously the Atlanta Dream they had those really good teams. Uh, about a decade ago and just couldn't get over the hump, whether it was playing Seattle or other really good teams. So I really want to see her get that chance. So I'm picking the aces to win it. And I think especially 
when I saw, and she's the MVP for a reason, first and foremost, let, let's start there. But what I saw from Asia Wilson in game two, I mean, my goodness, that, that was yeah. MVP Asia Wilson. She took so, over down the stretch. Absolutely. 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 So I'm going to go aces. And I know, I believe Alyssa Thomas, she, you know, we talked about both torn labor yeah. uh, in, in the first podcast. And I know she, she had, she got hurt again uh, last game. So I'm, I'm going, I'm going aces. I'll say, I'll say three, one. Okay. All right. They're going to win the next yeah. two games. I'll say they'll win the next two. So I, so I was thinking about four and a half games, like somewhere there. Uh, like I was going to take the aces as well because of the Alyssa Thomas injury. I saw an injury report today, and obviously by the time you watch this, you're going to know if she's going to play or not. But like mm-hmm. it says she's questionable for game three, which I mean would be incredible if she played. You know, she she got hurt five minutes into that. I mean, I don't know how she's playing this season. Like, Me neither. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, much less, you know, putting up 26, 13, and 5 in a playoff game and just having an incredible season overall. Like, if Alyssa Thomas can't play, I think they're done in four. That said, like, the Connecticut Sun, that that injury happened midway through the first quarter or whatever, and the Sun still had a four-point lead going in the fourth quarter of the game, too. So, like, they're not uh, they're not just, like, a one-hit wonder with Alyssa Thomas. Obviously, Dewana Bonner is incredible to watch. I'm a big fan of Brianna Jones inside – Getting Breon January back, like she she uh, couldn't start the the season, um, so like getting Brianna January Breon excuse me Breon January in the fold really helped this team, um, and, and so with those players that they have, they could make this a five game series, and I wouldn't be surprised if they won if Alyssa Thomas plays. But I'm still gonna say aces in five. I'm gonna say I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the Sun another game. I think also since I went with my Lynx pick in the other series, uh, I don't want Coach McCall, obviously at CC Bakersfield, yeah. <laughs> uh, father of Dewana Bonner and Erica McCall. I don't want him to have to go through that pain and suffering of watching both daughters go against each yeah. other as well. So I can't, I, if I pick the Lynx, I can't pick Connecticut to, <laughs> to win. And that was a pretty funny tweet I saw from Erica oh, McCall yeah. a few days ago. I as remember well. that. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so moving forward, we talked about the bubble. So let's head to the bubble. Obviously, uh, last night, again, we're recording on Thursday. Miami Heat, who I tried to tell people about before, being a, a dangerous, you know, scary team, a big lead now on the Celtics. And then, of course, uh, tonight, we'll know who wins this game tomorrow. The L.A. Lakers going up against the Denver Nuggets. Uh, Denver, you know, whenever they're down, they always find this extra gear to get going. And so, yeah, how do you see those two series playing out, Kev? Yeah, so I'll start with Miami and Boston. And uh, I will say, obviously, the, the Miami Heat have a, have a Santa Cruz Warrior on their team, Kendrick Nunn. So I would obviously like to see the Miami Heat win that game <laughs> uh, or, or that series. I do think it could be done in five. Uh, the Celtics are a tough-minded team. I will say I'm going to hedge my bet a little bit and say Miami in six. Okay. As far as the Denver Lakers series, like I thought it was going to be a gentleman sweep five-game series where Denver showed up for one game, like really looks good, and then just Lakers plaster them the other ones. Denver could be up 2-1, right? Actually, probably should be up 2-1, right? With the buzzer beater, Lakers. right? Like, yeah, the buzzer beater from Anthony Davis. Um, obviously, you know, people had all sorts of fun with Mason Plumley, who could have been a Stanford Cardinal basketball player back in the day. That is a long story for another episode, but, uh, they had fun with him, like kind of like not, not being on the same level with the uh, same page with the other defenders and letting AD get that look off, but it was still a contested shot by Jokic. I, I, I think that this is a five and a half to six and a half game series. So I could see Denver winning another game, maybe another two, but the Lakers are still the superior team. I, I mean, I'm going to say Lakers. I'm going to stick with Lakers in five, but I'm, I would not be surprised if this goes seven. I, and I'm only saying Lakers in five is because I, that's what I thought at the beginning of the series. And I don't like to change my opinion until I have to. So <laughs> I'm going to say Lakers in five. What do you got? So here's my thing for tonight, and this is what I want to see. I need to see the dominant Anthony Davis tonight. Yeah. Uh, There was so much made from 
the last game, I think he only had two rebounds and, and they were late. And two then obviously rebounds. Dwight and JaVale, I believe they had one apiece. So, you know, he's, he's going to get his numbers. He, he's an offensive monster. But I, I need to see a dominant, aggressive Anthony Davis because I always tell people LeBron, without a doubt, is the most valuable player on the Lakers. But the player who I think really sets the tempo for how the team plays is, is how AD goes and how he, how he plays, especially early. If he's settling for those jump shots outside, whether it's threes or just on the perimeter, then that's how the Lakers kind of play as well. But when he's going to the basket, attacking, dunking on people, then the Lakers, they, their energy seems to pick up with that. Yep. So I, I'm expecting him to, to be that more aggressive AD to night two. Uh, but I, I, I agree with you. I can see a 4-2 Lakers. Uh, I just, again, I think that especially with the, the return of the playoff Rondo, uh, yeah, and, and yeah. especially, again, he did it defensively last game, which, yeah. I mean, that down that fourth quarter was impressive. It was one of the main reasons why that was even a game. Uh, I just think, like you said, the Lakers are the the better team. They're just too deep. And I think also, while it hasn't shown up as much in the bubble, you know, later the series go, I think that experience, especially playoff experience for the Lakers is going to be, is going to be big yeah. to close it, this one out. And how about like Dwight Howard being like an irritant? Who who would ever thought that like Dwight <laughs> Howard would be like this pesky guy off the bench who just brings all sorts of energy? And I mean, obviously he was a good defensive play, great defensive player, but like he's just known as like this hustle guy mm-hmm. who's just flying all over the court, getting under people's skin. Like, I mean, you're an, you're an ATL in. Like, you've seen this guy. Uh, did you ever watch him in high school? I mean, you must have been like ten his senior year or something. See, I was I saw him a little bit, but obviously, even growing up when he was with the Magic, same division as the Hawks, uh, you, you saw him a good bit. But yeah, to your point, it was he was so good because again, his defensive prowess and how athletic he was. But yeah. as we've seen from Dwight this whole season, and again, I'm sure part of it is when you think about Dwight and his career trajectory, it was supposed to be like without a doubt, you don't question this guy's a Hall of Famer. And yeah. now I think as it's gone on, you know, I still think eventually he will be, but because it hasn't, it's kind of plateaued, you know, whether it was he went to, it was Houston and then, I mean, well, first off LA, obviously his back was still hurt. Didn't really work out there. He goes to Houston. He was in Atlanta then Charlotte and DC. And now he's here again in LA. So I think people kind of forget how good this guy really was. Yeah. And, but I think that same time, because he's had to take all those trips and all those stops, he's got this little chip on the shoulder where he's taking that out on more than just Stan Van Gundy. And I, and I really like that. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. So we, you hear our predictions for, but did you give Miami? Oh, Boston? that's right. That's right. Uh, I, I mean, I'm going to go, I'm going to say Miami four two as well. Okay. Uh, I, I just think again, when you have these young guys, um, especially my goodness, Tyler hero, uh, I, I was trying to tell people whenever, you know, I look at hoops, hoop mixtape, all his life, all that good stuff. And when I looked at his high, high school highlight tapes, not even just the, the game itself, but his mentality, I was like, hey, this, this dude's a little different. A little yeah. different. And then obviously, I forget which game it was. There's was a game in Miami. Uh, Jimmy Butler gets a steal, and Tyler Hero gets it, and he pulls back out the shoot instead of, you know, have a good possession, whatever you want to call a good possession or going to the basket, he pulls back out, the shooter game went in three, knocks it down. And <laughs> I was just like, yeah, this, this dude, he's just wired differently. He's, yeah, he just he, is. But uh, he, He's a killer. Yeah. Um, but I thought this was an interesting tweet. I saw somebody, I forget who it was, they said, the Miami Heat are what everyone thought the Clippers were. And I was like, yeah, yeah exactly. Ah, that, I, I, I like that one. I yeah. like that one. It's a, it's a deep team. The uh, only difference is with the Clippers, and this is even no disrespect to Lou Williams, there, there are two guys on the Clippers that you expect to carry the load. And obviously Kawhi yeah. and Paul George. With the Heat, you know, outside of Jimmy Butler, it really is like, who's it going to be this night? You, yeah. you, you, you really don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, Bam is a phenomenal player offensively and defensively. Goran Dragic has been a – baller his whole career whether you know people seen it or not again Tyler Hero Jay Crowder's had some really good moments so that's the deep team I feel like everyone thought that Clippers were and then of course 
the head coach and just the organization in general. Eric Spolster is a phenomenal coach. And then there's the, the godfather, Pat Riley, yeah. where I think his influence just goes down the whole team, the whole organization. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go Heat 4-2. Cool. Well, I, I, I do have to get off in a couple of minutes, Wadi. But, uh, Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll finish this up uh, real quick, first and foremost. Uh, all my friends in the South rejoice. SEC football back this week. Uh, yeah. And we're already we have a ranked matchup. Uh, so we're, we're going to knock these out pretty quickly. Uh, first and foremost, so again, SEC, number eight, Auburn, number 23, Kentucky. Uh, I'm going to go Auburn here. I'm really excited to see what Bo Nix does year two as a starter. Uh, what, how, how do you see this one? I mean, there is a huge part of me that wants to take Kentucky over the Auburn paper tigers, as I call them, year after year. <laughs> uh, and that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Kentucky. Uh, the last couple of seasons, they've won 18 games. They had 10 and three two years ago, eight and five last year. I just, I mean, I just never believe in Auburn. And like, all right, yeah, obviously they've had some really good seasons. They were in the last ever BCS national championship game that they really could have won against Florida State. Mm -hmm. But I, nobody is consistently overrated more than the Auburn Paper Tigers. I'd say Notre Dame and Texas A&M would like a word. But <laughs> well, yeah, I, all right, touche. <laughs> Texas as well recently. That's right. That's right. That's right. They're they're no matter who they beat week one, they're back. Yeah. Um, so going to the NFL. That's our college football pick for the week. Going to the NFL, and so first one, the Chicago Bears going up against uh, well, the 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 Atlanta Falcons. Um, uh, um no, 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 nothing to talk about last week. No, no I mean, it's, not, nothing at all. It's nothing it's all. not like they gave up 570 yards of offense and blew a, you know, 20 nothing lead and, you know, gave up an onside kick that we'd never seen before. And and they certainly knew that they could touch the ball before it went 10 yards and all that, and they were prepared. Um, and that's why they – yeah. Um, they All right, if they don't beat the Bears this week, uh, cancel the season. Like, don't show up for the final 13. They're gonna they're gonna win this game. Like Vegas agrees, they're three points fa three point favorites against the two and Chicago Bears. If you can't beat Mitch Trubisky, I mean, all right, Trubisky he did go to the Pro Bowl a couple of years ago, so I'm not gonna like poo poo the guy. Uh, but Matt Ryan's a better quarterback. They've got an offense, and I think they can hold the Bears under 500 yards of offense. I think. Um. <laughs> gonna go with the falcons i the thing for me so as last week went and again uh kevin i've talked to you about how much i love dan quinn and yeah. it's like okay here we go we're on our way looking to like a really good big win for him and then things start collapsing and obviously with the falcons you can't think about big collapses without thinking about what happens at the super bowl that I keep trying to etch out of my mind but it, it, it just stays there yeah uh and so it's like again for Dan Quinn, and I, I see everything that the team talks about, how much they love him and, and they want to play for him. Well, it's like, here you go. You're yeah. o, you're 0 2. You shouldn't be 0 and 2. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you better show up. Yeah. Uh, especially since apparently fans will be allowed, I think, starting in October, some of the fans in, in the Mercedes Benz. So yeah. if they want any fans to show up, you better get this win. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, sure, I'll pick them too. Um, <laughs> so here we go. I think this is an interesting one. Um, Raiders and Patriots, obviously a very good game Sunday night. Patriots and Seahawks and Raiders with the big win, thank you, against the Saints on Monday night. Uh, interesting one up in, uh, in, in Foxborough. Yeah, LV goes from a Monday night home game to 3,000 miles Sunday, early more, you know, 10 a.m. body clock time. Patriots are going to win by two touchdowns. Okay, Patriots by two. Uh, I – well, we're, 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 it's going to be interesting. I think that the Raiders. Well, we'll see in the in the few weeks. Are the Raiders is the Raiders defense was it as good as they showed, or are the Saints not as good as people expected? Yeah. Uh, and and we'll see. Obviously, there's a different test that Cam Newton and this offense brings for the Raiders. But I think I'm just going to go with them on the ground. I think that Josh Jacobs again an absolute monster. I am going to pick them, and I don't know wow. how the Raider, how the Patriots, excuse me are going to match up with Darren Waller. He is just okay. – Yeah, problem. he's a beast. Yeah, I mean, so, I'll take it. I am also still a Raiders fan. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, again, Darren Waller, shout out Georgia Tech connection yeah. there too. Uh, 
And so we'll do this last one. Obviously, I know Kevin's got to go. Uh, the other team, well, I was about to say the other Bay Area team, but the Bay Area <laughs> team is up in New York. Both of these teams, I mean, you can talk about how entry riddled both of them are. Uh, 49ers on the road in New Jersey uh, playing against the Giants. I like the Santa Clara 49ers because that, that's where they play football games in Santa Clara in the 408. Uh, yeah, I mean, Sa- not having Saquon's going to hurt. Obviously, not having Nick Bosa sucks and probably going to be Nick Mullins as a starting quarterback. Mm-hmm. But they got enough They got enough weapons on offense uh, to, to, to get through the New York football giants. I'm taking the Niners to get to 2-1. and one. So there was this big question – last week about why did the 49ers have all these injuries and you know some people blame the turf at MetLife which again they're playing in the same stadium this week uh obviously my whole stance on it is you didn't have a preseason you rushed their chain camp without much contact this is this is just the nature of the game this is what happens yeah. um but I think to your point like you said I I just feel like the you take away Saquon and not even the fact of the Giants don't have weapons because their receiving core is actually pretty good. They have a pretty good receiving core. Yeah. But that offensive line for the Giants, I just – I can't trust them. I can't believe in them uh, yeah. to where you have a chance to even let some of those downfield passes and opportunities happen. Uh, and and so I'm going to go with the 49ers. That being said, obviously my guy, Solomon Thomas, I know you mentioned Nick Bosa, he tore his ACL. But, you know, my teammate, little brother, Solomon yeah. Thomas, he tore his too. So – Solly, best wishes to you, man. Um, hope for the best and speedy recovery possible. For sure. So that will do it. That is episode two. Again, everyone, thanks for tuning in with us. Uh, another extra shout out again to Nor Davis uh, for joining us and, and talking about his career path and everything going on for him. And again, last but not least, I will continue, and I know Kevin will too, to say her name, Brianna Taylor. And unfortunately, Kevin, the way it looks like I'll be saying someone else's name sooner rather than later, too. Uh, And again, like I said, Black Lives Matter will continue to matter. We're not going anywhere.